Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank Great you. to see you. Thank you. Thank you. So we had a fascinating conversation I was mentioning to Howard in the back um, with Indra, who was a supporter, of course, of uh, Hillary Clinton. And um, Howard has been uh, one as well. So I thought I would start by just asking you what your reaction uh, to the news has been. Well, you know, I was prepared for the question. And even though it's, I'm prepared for it, I think it's difficult to answer. Um, there's no doubt that the country and the rest of the world are in a state of shock and disbelief. And I think uh, you got to take a step back and ask yourself, how did this happen and why? And I think it's, it's systemic. It's not based, for, at least for me as I look at it, just on the last year or two of, of just a very tough campaign. I think we're looking at years and years of uh, a great many people in America feeling as if they have not been heard, they haven't been listened to, and they've been let down. And as a result of that, there was an outcry for change, and we got it. And how does this align or not align? With, you, you run a company that I, I think of as a valued Based, a values based company. Yes. How do you think that this impacts that? Well, uh, Starbucks now has 25,000 stores in 75 countries. And in the US, we basically have a store in almost every community. The business model of Starbucks is about community, creating a third place, and economically trying to create uh, a balance between profit and benevolence. Uh, that's not going to change as a result of the leadership in Washington. The truth of the matter is Washington has been broken for quite some time and dysfunctional and polarized. And one of the reasons why, as a company, we have used our platform for social impact and social change is because we believe that the rules of engagement for a public company today is very, very different as a result of the fact that Washington has not done its job. So. First company in America to give equity in the form of stock options. First company in America to give comprehensive health insurance. First company in America to give a four-year college degree. These are all things that we feel are now incumbent upon a company to do for its people and its community. So the short answer is whatever is going to happen in Washington as a result of the Trump administration is not going to affect how we are going to take care of our people and do the things we need to do to keep innovating. Right. But do you feel like you're directly at odds with, with, with Mr. Trump or President Trump or President-elect Trump, uh, I should say. And let me just read you something. Uh, this was back in no last November, rally in Springfield, Illinois. He says, I have one of the most successful Starbucks in Trump Tower. Not true. Maybe we should boycott. <laughs> he says, maybe we should boycott Starbucks. I don't know. Seriously, I don't care. That's the end of that lease. Who cares? He then goes on to say, if I become president, we're all going to be saying Merry Christmas again. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. And of course, uh, that relates to the cups. Yeah. You know, uh, every now and then you wake up and you say, what? <laughs> uh, so I see this gentleman has the red cup in the front row. So for. 25 consecutive years, we have come out with a red cup for holiday, which pretty much has been the, the emblematic symbol of Christmas in America. And last year, we had a spectacular red cup. But unfortunately, we decided that it should just be red, nothing on it. But we've never had signs of Christ or Christmas specifically. And at the time, uh, President-elect Trump decided that we were anti-Christmas and called for a boycott. The irony was we had our best Christmas ever last year, and our business went up. So I thanked them. <laughs> this could be good for business. What do, if, to me, the Starbucks brand has almost become iconic as an American brand? It, yeah. it, it, and how do you, you just got back from China, and I know you're in Japan. How do you think that we are viewed? And how has that changed or not, given what's happened 48 hours ago? Uh, you know, the way I would answer that is this way. I, I think um, 
unfortunately, there's been a lack of truth and authenticity uh, in America for a while. Um, and that has affected uh, a level of trust and confidence in institutions and government. Um, and so when you carry the American flag uh, from the US to another country, there is both a feeling of pride because of the American story and the American promise. And then I think there's a new level of skepticism as a result of things that have happened over recent years. And then it's up to you, I think, to try and be the kind of company uh, that speaks truth, that's values-based, that takes care of its people. And in China, I mean, uh, we've been in China for 17 years. We have 2,400 stores. We open a store a day. Uh, it's going to be a great market for us. We've done things in China that are very un-American and very unusual. As an example, uh, we have an annual meeting of parents of our employees in China. And uh, we started doing that to celebrate the family and to demonstrate respect and humility because of the importance of the family and the one child within the family. And so I think uh, the question is, how do you build a global business as an American company demonstrating sincerity, humility, and a level of uh, uh, not entitlement that you have to earn right. success. And I think what, that's what we've tried to do. Uh, I think the short answer to your question is, 20 years ago, there was a lot more, I think, admiration than there is today. And I think there's much more of a burden today to prove yourself uh, and to demonstrate truth and authenticity. Let me ask you about um, being a company that, that prides itself on social movements, social good. Yes. Uh, you get in, you've gotten involved in lots of different issues, sometimes, even oftentimes, controversial. And Not by design, but by the fact that we think that's our responsibility. And, and that's what I want to talk about. Yeah. There are some shareholders, and I think it was just a year or two ago, where a shareholder stood up during uh, your annual meeting and said, why are you doing this? Shouldn't you just be off running a, a, yeah. a retail coffee company? That's yeah. Focus on the business, focus on the shareholders, leave all this other stuff alone. Well, that particular story was at our annual meeting, uh, which was two years ago, we had a 38% return on investment for the year. And the shareholder was criticizing us for not doing better as a result of our support of marriage equality uh, for uh, lesbians and gays. And uh, I just basically said, if 38% is not enough, it's a free country, uh, you should try and maybe buy another company's stock. But I think the question you're asking is this, is um, the rules of engagement for a public company today, in my view, are very, very different. First off, uh, we, we've had a great run as a 24-year public institution. And I would say unequivocally that our financial success is linked to the values of the company. But the question is, in a world where we are all viewing things that perhaps are inconsistent with how we think they should be done, should we hide behind and not take advantage of the platform we have? So as an example, uh, we felt very strongly that uh, uh, 46 out of 50 states in America have open carry, uh, which is uh, a law, and uh, people were walking in our stores with guns, and we just said respectfully, this probably isn't the right place to bring a gun into the store. Uh, I watched with horror over what was going on in America with regard to racial injustice, and we decided let's try and raise the national discourse and conversation on race relations. Uh, we didn't execute that well, uh, but it was the right thing to do, and I think the question that I try and ask myself all the time is metaphorically, when we're in a room trying to make decisions, there's two empty seats, one for a customer and one for our people. And the question is, is this decision going to make them proud? And if the answer is yes, we are on the right side of the debate. What's it done, so taking some of these positions, what's it done to the business? Wow. Do you think, it's, do you think ultimately it's proved um, beneficial? And, and I'm not gonna, I yeah. hope this is not going to sound uh, cynical, though, but from a marketing perspective. Well, people would say this is 
This yeah. is just, this is a, there's a certain set of values that Starbucks represents, and this is great marketing for that. Yeah, well first off, uh, we, we are not a great marketing company, and we spend very little money on traditional advertising. But I can promise you that every initiative that we have taken, uh, whether it is the support of veterans, the issue around guns, race relations, jobs, uh, every single initiative has nothing to do with a press release or marketing. It has everything we, to do with trying to advance the cause of humanity in America. Right. And we think that's our responsibility. I want to get into the business in just a moment, but let me ask you two very uh, political questions. Yeah. Uh, people often say, and you've, I'm sure you've heard this before, that you will one day run for office. Will you? Well, uh, on a day like today, I don't think that's, this is the day to answer that question. But, uh, you know, I, I have a day job. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy in what I do. I, I remain concerned and active in the future of the country, and I would say this. Uh, you know, I grew up on the other side of the tracks in Brooklyn, New York, in the projects. I am living proof of the American dream. I'm deeply rooted in the promise of America and the aspiration of the country. I'm concerned about the future of the country. And if I could do anything as a private citizen, as I am now, to try and advance that cause, that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, let me make it more complicated. Let's pretend when you get off the stage, Donald Trump calls you yeah. and says, look, you're one of the smartest guys I know. Come and be in my cabinet. Yeah. You say what? I don't think that's for me. <laughs> there's nothing that you would, you, you, there's no job you would take under I, Donald I, Trump? I, listen, I, I have an important job right now, and, I'm, and my fiduciary responsibility is to Starbucks. Okay, good answer. Um, <laughs> let's talk about uh, the minimum wage, because one of the things you recently did was uh, yeah. raise yes. uh, the wage that you're paying. Uh, your people. How is it? We, we talked to Mark Bertolini earlier today. He raised his uh, wage to $16. What do you think is the right minimum wage in this country? And should it be applied federally? I don't think it should be a federal mandate. I think it should be up to the state. Uh, Starbucks has had a 45 year history of o always paying above minimum wage. Um, I don't know what the exact wage should be because I think it's state specific. But I also think it should be looked at in terms of total comp. And total comp is not only about wages. So, uh, you know, we're giving 14% of people's base pay in the equity and equity form of stock options. Uh, the the health care plan has started, all these things that we're doing. So I think over time what will happen is people will probably get a menu and there'll be an a la carte choice of what they want their benefits to be and pay will be one of them. Right. But we want to and we will consistently pay above minimum wage. Uh, we talked to Eric Schmidt earlier this morning uh, about machine learning and AI, and invariably the issue of jobs comes up uh -huh. and technology. Yeah, um, you have been uh, very aggressive about using technology uh, in the stores, mobile apps, yeah, payment, all of that. Paint a picture for what it looks like as a consumer walking into a Starbucks in five years, and how many employees will be there? The same number? I mean, do you, do you see this changing in a material way as a function of technology? I don't think for us there will be a significant change in the amount of people that will be working at Starbucks and serving our customers. And the reason for that is that the equity of the Starbucks brand is based on the experience that comes to life with our people. There will be a significant level of investment and transformation with regard to the mobile ecosystem at Starbucks, but that won't affect the, the amount of jobs, the amount of people we employ. We employ 330,000 people worldwide. and. Uh, opening 2,000 stores a year, and that will continue in terms of the number of people be in, right. in our store. Um, let's talk about the consumer right now, uh -huh. globally. Yeah. Um, you were, you were, we were talking about China uh, yeah. backstage. You, you said we all got it wrong on China at the moment. Well, uh, you know, Starbucks has been betting uh, big and playing the long game in China for 17 years. Uh, our China business is very strong. I'm there almost one quarter a month. I've been there for 10 years like that. One quarter a month or one quarter a year? One, one, one quarter. No, one, I, I go one, once a quarter. Once a quarter, okay. Uh, so, you know, there's going to be 600 million middle class Chinese, and there will be cyclical changes as a result of the economic transformation under President Xi. And there will be times when, uh, the, the economy and issues in China will result in the media, I think, over 
uh, writing and overestimating the changes. I believe that the Chinese consumer and the economic opportunities there are really, really robust and worth the investment. Our business in China, I think, will be bigger than the business we have in the U.S. over time. And oh, what about Japan? You're there. Uh, I think Japan is going through another transitional time. We have a thousand stores there. We've been there many years. Uh, I'm bullish on Japan. I'm bullish on India. Uh, these are places, where the, although you've got to play the long game, which is not consistent, as you know, with the mentality of the people on Wall Street. I mean, we just had our best year and best quarter of our 46-year history, and one of your colleagues said it wasn't enough. I mean, uh, it's, it's strange, actually. So what, what's the answer, though? And, and uh, Bill Ackman's going to be here uh, yeah. later this afternoon. Send him my regards. Um, <laughs> Indra Nui wanted uh, me to send the regards, too. Um, well, I'll ask you the same question I asked Indra, actually, yeah, yeah. which is, what would you tell an activist? How, how should an, what is the proper role of an activist? And, and how should well, we all think about this, then? Well, you have to ask yourself, how did, what was the catalyst for activism? Uh, in a way, it's like, what was the catalyst for unions? And uh, the catalyst is that there are bad actors. Uh, but not all companies are evil, and not all management teams are bad. And so uh, when a company is doing the right thing and, uh, and taking the long view and doing everything it can to su share success with their employees and take care of the shareholders, there should be no room for the kind of activism that we've seen over the years, which in, which in many cases, more often than not, when you really kind of do the math and the dust settles, is about financial engineering that could destroy a company. Now, uh, Mr. Ackman, if you go back, uh, and, and I know this story very well because Mike Ullman, who was the CEO of JCPenney, JC Penney. one of my dearest friends uh, when he was the CEO of JCPenney, uh, if you look at what happened at JCPenney, uh, that is a scorched earth result that took the jobs and the livelihoods of tens of thousands of people for what? So, uh, and then you know, the flip side is there are companies that I think require the kind of activism uh, that that uh, should I think take place because there are companies that are not doing the right thing. So, but but I think Washington should also understand, and we heard a lot of rhetoric during the campaign season about the 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 evil of business. Uh, you know, we are creating the jobs in America, and, and capitalism is a, uh, an unbelievable source of revenue and opportunities for people across the country, and most businesses are good. Do you think most Democrats believe that? Uh, I can't speak for the Democratic Party. No, it's just because clearly uh, yeah. where Bernie Sanders sits. Yeah. Or Elizabeth Warren sits is a little bit yeah. different than where Hillary Clinton went. Yeah, I, no, I, I think that in, in the political season that we just went through with such vitriolic display of anger and hatred, so many things were said and uh, thrown around that I think while people were saying it, they knew it wasn't true. Um, let's open it up for questions. And as we get some mics, uh, as some of the mics come down, you were telling me something which I just thought was very interesting. I, I was saying to you, uh, what do you, what do you read in the morning? And you were sort of, tell everybody what you do in the morning, because I thought it was sort of interesting. It's not that interesting, really. I thought it was fascinating. Okay. Well, you know, we are a retail company that requires uh, a, a very, I think, intense, acute understanding of the business on a day-to-day -day basis. So at uh, around 4.30 in the morning, uh, because I'm crazy, uh, uh, I'm looking, as well as the management team at the company, a spreadsheet of basically every single Starbucks store and the sales results from yesterday. And I'm examining uh, what took place, and if there's any anomalies, it's going to jump out. And then we have a 7.30 meeting every single morning where we are kind of going through the trends and anything that happened. And, and that kind of sets the tone and the behavior of how we're going to act during the week. And since we're managing stores in different countries and we have different issues and currencies and labor strikes and government issues and work councils and language and politics, uh, we've got to be on this every minute. Of so the when day. you see an anomalous store, do you call them in the morning? 
Uh, you ever just dial up the manager? Uh, you know, I've done that. Uh, but not to find anything wrong, but more often than not, I'm calling a store to praise them as to what a phenomenal day you had. Congratulations. Let's share whatever happened as a best practice with everyone else in the company. So at 7.30, I want you to call in and tell everybody what, what happened in your story yesterday. Fair enough. Uh, we have some questions right here. Go ahead. Hi, Alexandra Labenthal from Labenthal. Um, Starbucks has been not only incredible in its diversity of its employees, but in also the diverse partners that you work with, of which I am actually one, so thank you very much. Um, given what we've seen just in the last 24 hours of some of the unbelievable actions and comments of people towards diverse people in our country, what can Starbucks or will Starbucks do to help create a better dialogue going forward for the next four years? You know, uh, we, we have an unusual opportunity as a company. Um, 90 million people a week are coming through our stores. And uh, we know through our own research that many people are coming into our stores, believe it or not, not only for the coffee, but for human connection. Uh, people are longing and I think hungry for a deep sense of humanity and the sense of community in the third place that we create. So anything we can do to create an uplifting environment of common decency and empathy and a, a renewed level of civility and respect uh, and demonstrate that every day, uh, I think that's an opportunity we have. And I think we are more than ever committed to doing that. Uh, one has to be concerned uh, that uh, over the last few months and even in the backdrop of the last 24 hours, we've seen, we've seen things that are quite disturbing. Uh, I got a picture this morning of a swatsista. Uh, I mean, I, this is, it's hard to understand. And so uh, I think as private citizens, we have to recognize, all of us, that we have a responsibility and a role to play to demonstrate empathy and compassion and try and do everything we can to walk in the shoes of other people. Question right here. Hi, I'm Kate Christensen from the Barclays FinTech Innovation Group. Um, so I read recently that Barclays, or excuse me, that Starbucks um, is the biggest seller of CDs still left on earth. And I was wondering what you see the role of Starbucks being intersectionally with the music and art industry in supporting new talent yeah. and giving it, giving it a stage. We don't sell as many CDs as we used to. Um, but you I, I Spotify, don't you now? What? Don't you have a deal with Spotify now? Yeah, we have a deal with Spotify, but we still sell a little bit of music. But I think we, uh, our customers have given us a license in areas of art to be a curator. And I think we, we take that very seriously and I think we want to do everything we can to kind of create a sense of discovery and introduce an opportunity for new artists to be discovered who possibly can't get that. And through literature and music and other things, we will try and do that. I also think we have an unbelievable opportunity on the mobile app. I mean, there's about three or four minutes wait time between you ordering your coffee and getting it and it's a three to four minute opportunity for content. And just last month, we had a, our first proprietary series that we created called Upstanders, which was 10 five minute videos of ordinary Americans doing extraordinary things. And we were shocked that 71 million Americans viewed those videos in four weeks. So we've got a great opportunity, I think, to elevate unique content uh, off the mobile app. I uh, had the pleasure of listening to your conference call, and towards the end of that call, you spent a lot of time talking about the fact there will be changing retail patterns and lifestyle patterns, which we've only begun to see. And I relate that to your comment about uh, a Starbucks store or restaurant being a place of community where people can use their Wi-Fi. Uh, I'm just curious how you see that, how you see positioning the relevance of your company and what you think will happen to uh, just the, the whole structure of how people spend their money and their time. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, I think it's an important question to try and answer. Um, three years ago, I spoke on a conference call about the seismic change uh, in the physical traffic in America, uh, that there's going to be less traffic in malls and less traffic on Main Street, primarily as a result of e-commerce and what I'll loosely describe as the Amazon effect on shopping. And I think what I said on the conference call is we are in the beginning stages of what I strongly believe will be a significant level of store closures in America. And you're beginning to see it among large boxes. You're also beginning to see even companies like Walmart say, we're going to invest more money in e-commerce than we are in new stores. So the country today is physically, in terms of bricks and mortar, over-retailed. Uh, and, that, and that phenomenon did not uh, begin with, with e-commerce, but as a result of it, uh, we're seeing there isn't enough people physically shopping in malls and in the streets of America to support the physical bricks and mortar stores. So many, many bricks and mortar stores are going to go away where the omni-channel uh, does not support that infrastructure. As a result of that, I think we're going to be in a very unique position because we're opening 2,000 stores a year around the world, 500 alone in China a year. And I think people are going to be seeking out unique places that are experiential, uh, that are uh, an opportunity to be among other people that are safe uh, and provide the kind of experience that is uplifting and joyful. And I think as a merchant and a retailer, our responsibility is not to intercept traffic, but to create a destination. And I, I think so we'll, we're in the beginning stages of this, but five, 10 years from now, the landscape and the footprint of existing retail today is going to be very, very different five to 10 years from now. But can you just play that out for a moment, which is yeah. to say, how does that affect jobs. All of those people, I imagine, yeah. are not going to be employed, yeah. or they're going to be employed in different jobs. And by the way, are those people your customers? Oh, I think, you know, we, we are certainly in a uh, evolutionary period uh, in terms of uh, how jobs are going to change and how uh, job training and education is going to re be required to reconstitute where these jobs are going to go. I, I don't have the answer as to where those jobs are going to go, but clearly the bricks and mortar retail stores that exist today, there's going to be a lot less of them in the future. Let's see if we can sneak one final question in. I saw a number of hands, but uh, right there in the back. I think uh, a year ago you uh, accepted to sell Michelin Gustin cookies uh, in your shop. Uh, because of their like innovative uh, marketing and viral strategies. Are you looking to, to promote those kinds of startups on the long term, speaking about long terms, or um, are you looking for you know new innovative um, startups? What, what kind of cookies? Michel and Augustine. The French, the French cookies, yes, yes. yes. Uh, that's a fantastic story, by the way. Are you with that company? No, but I'm French and I was You're just French. Them. <laughs> Can I, we have time for this story? Go for it. Okay, really quickly. Uh, you know, I, might, I have such a big heart for any entrepreneurial person that's trying to do something against all odds. And uh, two people show up at the front desk of Starbucks from France. They came from France. And I get a call saying, Howard, it's a crazy thing. These two people have arrived from France, and all they want to do is give you a sample of their cookie. So how can I say no to that? It's impossible. So I left my office. I ran to the front desk. I met these people. And I fell in love with these two French kids. And I brought them back to my office. I brought a few other people in. I said, taste these cookies. What do you think? Everybody liked them. And I said, you know what? This is your day. <laughs> you are going to have your cookies in every Starbucks store in 30 days. And that's what happened. Wow. <laughs> Howard Schultz, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.